Hello, hello everyone. This is your host again, Akhil Jabbar, and welcome to another episode of SaaS District. As a CEO and leader of any stage startup, I know that there's always room to improve and become a better leader for your team, your shareholders, and more importantly, yourself. On today's episode, we'll be talking about how to unlock your potential and become a more effective CEO and leader for your startup. That being said, we have an expert guest with us, Mark Green. Mark is a speaker, author, strategic advisor, and a business and leadership growth coach. He facilitates workshops with executive teams to help them stay on track, hit their goals, and continue growing. Mark also coaches CEOs and executive teams all over the world, where he's worked with thousands of different business leaders, helping them unlock more of their potential, and also teaching them how to do the same for their teams. Mark is the author of the book, Activators, a CEO's guide to a clearer thinking and getting things done and creating a culture of accountability. He is a certified behavior analyst, a certified values analyst, and a certified attribute index analyst. Mark is also the founder and president of Performance Dynamic Group, where he has developed a track record over the last 21 years, helping organizations accelerate their revenue and profit growth. He works with companies across a wide range of, in, wide range of industries, starting from you know, startups all the way to companies generating over $40 billion in revenue where he works with executive and sales teams to dramatically increase their performance and their personal results. Uh, So Mark, hopefully that was a good introduction. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, Hi, good to, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, So if if there was anything I missed, could you maybe just share a bit about, you know, your background and how was it that you got to where you are today as an executive coach working with the CEOs? Sure. So I have a degree in psychology and business and uh, about um, 10 years into my career working for a fairly large company, I had the opportunity to start to work for a series of small businesses. And um, that gave me some experience there in the world of entrepreneurism and small, small market. I had an opportunity a few years later to step back and reassess what I wanted to do in my career and decided in 2003 to launch my own business, which started as a leadership uh, Uh, training company, essentially, leadership development training company. And uh, over the years, that's evolved into my current coaching practice. And I've operated in the mode that I'm in right now for about the last nine years, where I coach CEOs and their executive teams as a team running high growth mid-market firms. That's my space today. So my clients run from probably about 30 million US to 400 million US in revenue or turnover. and uh, the employee base re- ranges from maybe a uh, hundred on the low end to well over a thousand on the high end. So these are pretty substantial businesses with a pretty serious growth agenda and a pretty seasoned leadership team. Um, and that's my space. As you mentioned, I've written a couple of books. And so I'm speaking more now and uh, sharing some thought leadership as well. Um, related to how I think uh, and what I see happening out there in an effort to reach more people beyond just the clients that I'm working for in a coaching relationship. And I guess, you know, given the current environment with obviously the, the COVID-19 virus, uh, you know, it's easy to get kind of distracted in, in, in your vision of what you're trying to build in a company with a lot of you know, things going on, a lot of moving parts. How are you guiding the CEOs that you're working with right now to stay focused and you know, lead their teams effectively over the next few months or you know, say for the entire year of 2020? Yeah, so I'm talking to my clients very actively about mental models and guiding principles right now because when there's a lot of uncertainty, you have to get back to basics, back to fundamentals. And one of the most fundamental mental models is around, I call it the Stockdale Paradox, um, named for Ad- Admiral James Stockdale, uh, who was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Um, But one of the principles of the Stockdale Paradox is this idea of recognizing and acknowledging the brutal truth, the brutal reality. And this principle helped me with my clients get them to realize before the rest of the world really started acting on this thing, that we need to start uh, moving here to protect our flanks and to start zeroing in on cash um, and making sure that we're making the right moves to protect ourselves. Um, and so I'm focused on mental models like this, um, and um, we, we call them essentialism, the Stockdale paradox, return on luck, and a bias to act. Those are the four primary mental models. 
Um, and then guiding principles, which are, uh, so mental models are more about how we think as leaders, discipline and thinking, and guiding principles are around how we act as leaders, what we do. And the three guiding principles that we're focused on now is agility, structure, and humanity. And the balancing of those three things to manage through this time with uh, a distributed team. So, so a little just for you know context for audience, you're working with you know profiles of the leaders you're working with and CEOs. They're kind of you know mid market companies. Uh, you know, as a CEO, you think they're you know already high performers. You know, they're already at top of their game if they're at that level and in that size of a business. But obviously, there is a huge value of somebody like you working with them. What exactly, you know, if you get in more detail, are you trying to achieve with them when you're work, you know, coaching with them and, and, and working with them? Sure. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I pride myself on working with clients who, by any external measure, look like they're already tremendously successful. And they are. And they are. And the reality is, is that the right client for me is somebody who is driven for more and driven to continually improve themselves as a leader. You know, humility and learning are two very, very powerful attributes of any business leader um, because you should always be learning and growing. And one of the things I've said for years that, that I repeat all the time is, is this little nugget um, that I think your listeners will find helpful. I have never seen a business with a sustainable growth rate that exceeds the personal growth rate of the people who run it. Right. And so you've got to be open to continually pushing the envelope and learning and growing. And that's what I bring to the table. Um, my clients really, cons my coaching clients consider me to be like a chief bar raiser on the mm -hmm. team, mm -hmm. always raising the bar in terms of the expectation of performance of the individuals on the team and the team as a unit. And of course, the results of the business over time. And so in that regard, you might a picture then that our work is never done, okay? Because there's always the next thing, the next thing, the next thing over time. And so, in fact, many of my client relationships last multi, multi, multi years um, over time. And I, and I quite like that because um, we really get into, um, into a groove. And in some respects, I can, I can become almost in some ways a part of that team. Nice. Yeah, I, I know like as a, you know, as a high performer, you can either, you know, set the bar, you know, maybe too low and then it becomes, you know, not a challenge and then you're not really pushed to kind of your potential or maybe you set it too high and then, you know, if you don't hit it, you get kind of discouraged. So I think I see the value where, you know, if you have some external, you know, somebody from externally looking at in from a, you know, more non judgmental or somebody who understands you better than maybe you do yourself, uh, you can, you know, set a realistic goal to keep kind of pushing you to where you actually are, right? Just like any coach and, you know, whether it's fitness or, or anything else, right? Yeah, and, and one of the things about coaching that people don't talk about enough is the idea of pattern recognition as mm. the value of what a coach brings, right? So you might be a CEO running a startup or a business, and you've got your own experience, and you've got what you're in the middle of. But as a coach, I come in, and I've seen hundreds of CEOs just like you in the same situation, in the same circumstances, and I've seen the patterns of success and the patterns that lead to trouble. And, and so one of the things that you get when you engage or even just have a casual conversation with a coach, somebody who's qualified as coach with the right experience, is that you get the benefit of their pattern recognition. Um, so I get asked all the time, well, how did you know to say that? Or how did you know to ask that question? Or how did you know to make that suggestion? And, and the answer is always, well, I don't know how I know, but I just knew and it's pattern recognition because I've had enough repetition of these scenarios and situations mm. that I can, I can sort of be on instinct and, and kind of know where to go in a conversation that ends up breaking things loose or helping somebody move forward somehow. And so it's a very important thing because we all have our own biases and blind spots as leaders. And it's this aspect of pattern recognition um, via an external resource that's very, very valuable. Yeah, so I, you know, from your perspective, you're able to see, you know, what based on the patterns, you know, what kind of sh they should be focusing on. Um, there's a saying I think I heard a few weeks ago where I think, you know, the best advice is maybe just, you know, no normally just to follow your own advice. So maybe in the back of your head, you might already know what to do. Um, and sometimes you're seeking more information 
just to kind of validate it and you know but then you just keep hesitating why do you think is it so difficult for leaders to execute on you know what they already quote unquote on know that they should be doing yeah well so you've hit a, a nerve on this one right this is the heart of of the premise of my book activators and it's it's this question of you know if we generally know what we should be doing and how to do it uh, why is it that we that we delay acting, right? And mm. just to make it real for people, for example, you might have uh, someone in your organization who is a high performer but toxic to your culture, and you know this, and you know that they're not good for your culture, and yet as a leader, you just delay doing anything about it, or you find ways to rationalize why we need to keep this this person here. And, and yet you know that they don't belong, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you finally do something about it, maybe two years down the road or three years down the road, um, you get a big line of people in front of your door saying, thank you, it's about time. And you think to yourself, wow, I should have done this years ago, right? Um, and, and the list goes on and on and on. I could get example after example after example like that where, um, you know, I know I should change my banking relationship, but, you know, and then you come up with all the reasons why you don't, right? And, and it's all these things. And so the research that I did for the book Activators is, is all around this. And what I found is that there are three hidden growth killers that operate inside our minds okay. that really silently uh, influence our ability to, to think and act on these things that we know. And they are our motivators, our habits, and our beliefs. And um, I unpack all of this in the book and came up with eight activators that are the things that we can do as leaders to, to sort of combat these hidden growth killers that suboptimize our ability to make the right decisions and take the right actions um, without being so subject to um, these unconscious forces that are happening within us. Makes sense. Yeah, I think I heard an interesting quote uh, a few days ago. If we all did what we, you know, with the inform, we all did on what we, uh, the information that we knew, we'd all be billionaires and have six pack abs, right? So I mean, it's not the the lack of information is there. It's just more about executing and doing what we should be doing, right? Um, that's that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, and I think you you mentioned about habits. I know how important habits or positive habits can be. They can be you know detrimental or positive. Um, as a startup founder with maybe say less experience as a CEO, um, would you say there are any leadership or you know general habits that you they should be aware of uh, to be more productive as a CEO that you've seen uh, you know across all the CEOs you've worked with? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a, a list of ten productive leadership habits um, that I that I put in the book Activators, and I'll highlight three of them to be specifically relevant to your listeners. So the, the first also, by the way, is one of the mental models that I'm, that I'm working with my clients on right now. And uh, it's called Return on Luck. And um, author and business researcher Jim Collins came up with this concept uh, a number of years ago when people were challenging his findings on the things that made high performing businesses different than lower performing businesses. And, th and they said, well, yeah, but what if those businesses just got luckier, right? Or what if the lower performing businesses just got unluckier and that explains the result difference? And so he actually unpacked this and did the research. And what he found is fascinating. Statistically, none of us as human beings or none, no businesses out there are any luckier or unluckier than any others, okay? Um, what makes all the difference in the world is how we choose to respond to a luck event, whether it's a good luck event or a bad luck event. And you could make the argument right now in this global pandemic, we might be in the middle of a bad luck event, okay? And what's gonna make the difference in terms of who comes out of this on top and who doesn't is how those leaders are choosing to respond to the luck. So as an entrepreneur, starting a business, okay, starting a SaaS business, for example, uh, guess what? Good things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. And you have to maintain an even keel and always be looking to generate the return on what happens, whether it's good or bad. So just because something good happens doesn't mean you say, oh, thank goodness, something good happened. Let's enjoy this. What, what I teach my clients to do is actually lean in and say, okay, something good happened. What can we do to actually make it even better or take further advantage of the good thing that happened while we can? 
that's generating a return in that this case on good luck. And the reverse is true that when something bad happens, we lose a big deal or our, our investment round falls through or something happens that's bad. We want to say, okay, that happened. Now, how do I make something good come of that? What is it that can come of this that's a value that's good? And that's return on luck thinking as a leadership habit. So that's the first habit I want to outline. Okay. The second habit is to seek simplicity. Seek simplicity. You know, we are masters of complexity because we're sort of brainwashed by a lot of marketing, quite frankly, that complexity equals value, right? Sure. Um, and, uh, and for those of you, those, those clients of yours or the listeners out there that are in businesses where there's a lot of engineering talent, um, it's even worse because, um, you know, engineers like, uh, like complexity as well. And so as a leader, you've got to always seek simplicity um, because the odds are the simplest thing is usually the explanation and the simplest thing is usually the best solution. Um, and yet often we're seduced into complexity. And uh, that doesn't serve us and it doesn't serve our, our organizations, right? So seeking simplicity is the second habit I would share. And the third habit uh, is really also another timeless one for leaders, over-communicate, mm. over-communicate. See, as, as humans, um, we're not very good communicators. Uh, we have a lot of biases and blind spots that lead us to believe that other people have the same information generally that we have. And you kind of know this if you've ever been at a party and you hear somebody tell a story, but they start the story at a place where you actually have no idea what they're talking about. Mm. Okay. Mm. Has that happened to you? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, right. Of course. And it's been, and, and you'd say, well, wait a minute, why is this person starting a story at a place that, that I have no idea. And the reason is because they actually think you're right there with them. Okay. <laughs> it's how their brain, it's how their brain works. Right. And, and so how do we resist this as leaders? Uh, and the answer is over-communicate and, and you cannot over-communicate. Uh, and my rule of thumb around communication, and I beat this into my clients, is um, until your team is literally rolling their eyes and <laughs> finishing your sentences, you haven't communicated enough as a leader. And that's something to think about uh, because it, otherwise it's very, very difficult to actually get people on the same page um, as opposed to just imagining people are on the same page and assuming that they are and they're not. Yeah, that's a really good point. I know myself as an introvert, sometimes, you know, in your mind, it's so clear that, you know, what's going on that everybody should know that. Uh, but I think, you know, that's something I, need, I know. I know I've been told in the where I need to just keep you know, over communicating. So I know that's something I, I personally need to work on as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, so those are three of the top 10 habits that I would share as most relevant probably mm. with, um, with your listeners today. Okay. As you start kind of working closely with executives and understand their business better, you know, issues, you know, the patterns start to come up. Um, you, you know, maybe there's, there's times in, the, in periods during their business where you know, they're growing and there's other times where they feel stuck. Um, how do you kind of get them to unlock that you know, area where they're stuck and you know, how do they work or... I'm sorry, you know, um, on the hidden growth killers, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's, it's really around um, reading between the lines, right? And this is where it's difficult to self-medicate as a leader, right? If you're stuck, sometimes it really is hard to, um, uh, to sort of self-assess and, 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 and really um, self-diagnose and, and help yourself get unstuck. I think that you, you have to be surrounded by the right people mm. as, as a start, right? And people who are willing to really listen and who are willing to point things out to you that might be uncomfortable, mm. okay? And so as a coach, that's, that's my primary mechanism, okay, is to help somebody see something that they're not seeing that then gives them the ability to evaluate whatever that thing is and then make different choices around it Whereas if I can't see that thing, okay, I feel very stuck, mm. right? And it's funny because I'm, I'm operating in this mode right now um, with uh, um, it, my extended network, as, as a lot of people are right now in the world. Um, I'm trying to get out and contribute and do good, um, even where I'm not necessarily being paid. Um, and so I'm doing a little bit more pro bono work and, and coaching leaders where somebody I know 
who needs a little bit of help and I'll say, hey, let's hop on a call for an hour um, and I'm not charging for it and let's just spend some time together and I'm helping people. And I had a conversation um, last week uh, with, a, with a business leader uh, who was stuck just like this and couldn't figure out a mechanism to move forward when his primary client demographic was completely shut down in, in the current pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was because he was just sort of stuck seeing things the way they've always been. And all I did was ask a bunch of questions to help him zoom out and have a different look at what the real needs of his clients are today as opposed to what the needs of his clients are under normal circumstances. And he was able to then find a way to be unstuck by seeing a possibility that he didn't see before. Okay. Um, and so I guess the real answer to this question is you've, you've got to surround yourself as a leader with people who are able to see your blind spots mm -hmm. and able to articulate them and point them out to you um, so that you can then have the opportunity to react to them. Yeah, it makes sense. So I, I know there's a saying, you know, you're the average of the five people you, you surround yourself with kind of on a day to day basis, you kind of build off those habits, you know, as a new startup founder, you know, why is it important? And how do you suggest finding and developing that work network outside of, you know, having a coach, but also on a day to day basis, maybe you're just you feel lonely with just your team around you, or maybe you don't feel you can talk to them about some of these things, because it might affect their kind of performance. Um, but you know, you need to have that kind of externally and, you know, people who are, you know, bringing you up and, and being able to get you to be unstuck. Yeah, for sure. So when, um, when I was looking for my first house years ago, uh, my grandpa Ben, my mother's father, um, gave me some advice. He said, Mark, I got some, some real estate advice for you. And I was young at the time and I said, great, what's, what's your real estate advice? He said, never ever buy the most expensive house in the neighborhood mm -hmm. because if you own the most expensive house in the neighborhood, over time, there's only one way that the other properties can, can affect the value of your house, right? They're going to drag it down over time. And at the time, look, I was, I was a kid looking for my first house. I thought, all right, that makes sense. Thank you very much for your advice. And, and I followed his advice, right? And, and bought my first house and all of that. It wasn't until about a decade later, um, and unfortunately, he had passed away by this time, but until a decade later that I realized that Grandpa Ben was not giving me real estate advice. And here's what was going on. I, was, uh, 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 I had set up my own company. I was doing leadership development training. Um, I was in a network of professionals who were doing the same work as I was. And I had kind of worked my way into being among the most successful people in that network. Great. Okay. And I realized that I had become one of the most expensive houses in my professional neighborhood. And it was actually affecting my ability to continue to grow, okay? And it's not that I was surrounded by bad people or dumb people or anything bad. It was just that, that I was at a different level where they were spending a lot more time asking for my help than I was able to ask for their help based on where I was. And so this was fascinating. And, and, uh, and so this, this insight led me to build one of the activators actually in the book, um, which is called Change Your Neighborhood. And I built a tool around this. And the idea is that we get into what I call comfort zone networks, like um, a forum or a peer group, or even a coaching relationship or a professional relationship with an accountant or, a, or an attorney, where over time, it doesn't serve you anymore. And it's a comfort zone thing. And, and, and you know, the, the, the measure of this is you need to be surrounded by people who actually make you a little uncomfortable. Mm. Because it's like you never know what the next question is going to be. Or you're, you're kind of sitting there going, well, boy, I hope he doesn't really ask me any more <laughs> questions about this because I know I'm not going to like the answer and right. it's going to make me really uncomfortable. But then you also know, like, but I kind of need that, right? Right, right. And, and that's how you know you're at the right level in a network. And, and so the Change Your Neighborhood tool is actually a deliberate way mm. to help a leader cultivate the next level of people that they need to be surrounded by. And you know what? In today's connected world with social media and all of that, mm. it's really quite incredible. You, you can find a way to be introduced to almost anybody on the planet if you really work hard enough at it. 
Um, and so why not create a list of people in your industry or in domains that you respect who you want to meet, who you want to meet and talk to and start working to figure out how to get introduced to them. And, and that's what the change your neighborhood tool is, uh, is all about. And the sooner an entrepreneur or a business leader can get this idea and really start this process. It's like a continually, you know, ratcheting up over time. You always looking for the next, for the next, for the next, for the next. <clears throat> it really will, uh, will propel them um, and, uh, and keep them learning and growing and, and moving forward at the edge of their comfort zone, which is all where all the good stuff has to happen, right? Makes sense. Yeah, so you, you know, online, you know, it doesn't have to be specifically. I think maybe people get stuck to their, you know, geographical location of where they are, and maybe they can't find that. You know, you don't have to go all the way. You don't. You, you have to fly down and move your stuff all the way to, you know, San Francisco to, to get that network these days, right? So, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So on on the leadership guide, um, you know, you you have to kind of find it in you to keep kind of inspiring your team and produce at a high level as as a leader. You know, not only for yourself, but you know, pass it on to your team. How do you guide the you know, founders to keep inspiring their team and produce at, at a high level, level so that they obviously look up to you on a day-to-day -day basis so you know, you're, you're not being exceeded by your team, right? And, and as... Yeah, so, uh, so, so this is getting into the topic of, um, I think, a little bit of accountability, um, right? Which I, which I wrote about in my book, Creating a Culture of Accountability. Um, and there's a bit of a prescription here that I'll give your, your listeners. Okay. Um, the first, the first part hurts. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. The first part hurts. And, and that is you got to walk your own talk as a leader. Okay. You cannot be the kind of person that's telling people to do things. And then you yourself aren't doing those things. Okay. Um, and the most basic example is like, Hey, we have to show up to our meetings on time. And then as a leader, I, I, I don't show up on time, okay? And it's like, that doesn't work, okay? You, you, can't, you cannot do that and expect people to be accountable to something that you yourself as a leader can't be accountable for, right. okay? So you got to walk your own talk. The second element is to have high expectations, not just of yourself, which many of us as entrepreneurs do, but we have to have high expectations of our teams. And the reason, and there's a lot of behavioral research on this topic, that people will behave up to or down to the level of expectation that is put on them, mm. okay? And so, uh, and I've known them. If you're the kind of leader that thinks, um, oh, these people just show up to get a day's worth of pay, um, that's all they're good for, well, then guess what? That's exactly what you will get from them. And the reason is because you expect it, okay? And you treat them that way, and that's how they behave. Whereas if you say something different to yourself, like, you know, these people are coming to work every day to try to make a difference and do the best that they can. And I need to create a way to help them do the best they can every day. And I believe that they will. Okay. Then you're going to treat them differently. And all of a sudden, those same people are going to be behaving in a totally different way and, and creating something totally different for the business. Okay. So walk your own talk have high expectations, and then we get into the building blocks of accountability, which is how do we actually make people accountable over, over time, right. okay? And there's three building blocks that I, that I want to describe to your listeners, okay? The first is this building block that conveys the idea that I believe in you, okay? okay? So, for example, I believe, Dan, that, that you are very capable of doing this thing that I'm about to ask you to do, even though it's going to make you uncomfortable and it's going to stretch your capabilities. I know you can do it and that's why I'm giving it to you. Okay. Okay. I believe in you. Number two, this is important to me. Okay. That's the second building block. Mm. And so it's me telling you why this thing that I'm about to ask you to do really matters. Okay, why it matters to me as a leader and why it matters to the business or to the organization or even why it matters to your own career and development. Mm -hmm. And then the third building block is uh, I am watching. Mm. Okay, I am watching. Now, some people get bent out of shape about the language on this and they think, oh, that sounds very um, big brother-ish and I'm watching and is that really the kind of leader you want to be? Mm. Don't pay attention to the words. It's just this idea that I'm paying attention. Hmm. 
Okay. I'm paying attention. Right. And I had a, I had a boss that I worked for years ago, Mary, this woman, Marion, who I'm still in touch with today. She's the best boss I ever had. Mm -hmm. And uh, she used to make me crazy because she was the master at these three building blocks. Okay. And she would give me something to do that would be really challenging. And we would walk by each other in the hallway. And just as she walked by me, she would say something like, um, Hey, you know, that thing, it's going to be done by Thursday at five o'clock. Right. And she would just keep walking. Okay. And, and that's, that's, I'm watching, right. That's what that, that's, I'm watching in action. Okay. Because I would have to go back to my office and be like, darn it. Yeah, like I'm yeah. on the hook for this thing. Right. Right. Um, and, and I delivered and I delivered and she got the best out of me. Right. So don't get caught up in the words of I'm watching, but it's just this idea of conveying that I'm paying attention to this and I expect you to deliver right? When I'm, when we agree. Okay. Right. Um, and so that's kind of how I would frame that up um, in terms of how to get performance from your team, but it starts and ends with your own integrity as a leader and your ability to walk your own talk. I like that. So you set the belief, you kind of make, make it clear that it's important to you and then, you know, make sure there's a, a yeah, I guess some people can look at it as that as though you feel like they're micromanaging you. And then, you know, if, if they're walking by and say, hey, tomorrow, 5 p.m., it, you know, puts a kind of extra pressure on you. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I've got to deliver now. But, uh, you know, you don't feel there's any negative consequences of that, of like, you know, psychologically that maybe they feel that there's too much pressure. No, no, there's there's not because it's not all the time. This isn't like, you know, like beating somebody down like mm. that. Here, let me paint the opposite picture, which I okay. see a lot. OK, OK. We call it fire and forget. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's like, uh, Hey, Dan, I want you to go do this thing. And I need it next Friday at, uh, at end of business. Mm. And then nothing. And then next Friday at five o'clock comes and goes mm. and like nothing. And then it gets into next Monday and I send you an email and I'm like, Hey, where's the thing? Mm. Okay. And I get mad because now I'm like, Hey, Dan didn't deliver. How come Dan didn't deliver? Well, let's go back to our leadership habits. Remember over communicate? Right. I've actually violated that as a leader because I didn't, I didn't communicate the building blocks of accountability to you. <clears throat> and I didn't kind of demonstrate at least once or twice that I'm paying attention to this. Right. And so that's more typical of what happens. And so again, I'm not talking about like being right on top of somebody micromanaging, yeah. but if you contrast it to the normal sort of fire and forget mechanism of delegation, mm -hmm. you start to understand why it makes so much sense. Got it. So if you're trying to avoid that, you know, fire and forget, um, is there some tools or systems that you use? I know people use, you know, OKRs and KPIs and they keep track of that on like, you know, this daily or weekly basis you suggest for keeping that consistent accountability other than, you know, hey, doing a constant reminder, hey, it's due tomorrow, hey, it's due next week, hey, is there anything else you suggest there? Yeah, sure. So one of the things I do with all my clients is implement communication rhythms in a way that changes how they communicate inside the organization. And that includes daily huddles um, and weekly team meetings, in addition to monthly, quarterly, annual meetings, which is typically as a coach where I plug in to my clients, okay? Right, right. And mm -hmm. the idea of a daily huddle and a weekly meeting apply at the, at the unit level, at the team level. So this can cascade through an entire organization so that everybody in the organization is in at least one daily huddle and one weekly meeting per week. Um, and the, the, it's an excellent mechanism Okay, to reinforce this accountability um, because it, it's, a daily, it's a daily rhythm. And for, for people who aren't that familiar with this, a daily huddle literally well executed is 10 minutes. So you know, this is not something that's gonna take a lot of time out of your day. And I would make the argument very strongly that by investing the 10 minutes every day, you're probably saving yourself hours over the course of the week relative to non-accountable behavior, people misunderstanding things, poor communication, lack of coordination among members who are on the same team, um, and all of those other things. And so it's a very, very wise investment to make, but that's a mechanism that can really help with this. I like that. That's awesome. Um, on a management level, you know, I think, you know, maybe having, you know, poor, if you lack on some of these skills, uh, you, you might see this effect on your employees directly. Um, there's a saying, you know, employees join companies or startups, they don't leave the startup organization, they leave their managers. 
Do you, do you agree with that statement? Sure. A hundred percent, hundred, hundred percent. We see it all the time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so the real question then is how, how can I become the kind of leader uh, that employees want to stay with for a long period of time, right? Um, and a lot of the clues are in the stuff we're talking about here, quite right. frankly, right? Because if you have high expectations of the people on your team and they're the right people, they're going to love that environment, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to love the autonomy and the ability to be challenged and to continually learn and grow. Right. And one of the things that, that is a very um, negative behavior of leaders in terms of the impact on employees is this tendency to want to be the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to talk about this specifically <clears throat> because I see it quite commonly. You know, we get promoted from being a super worker into being a supervisor all of a sudden, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden I've got like people that are working for me. And the problem is the way I got to become a super worker, okay, is by being really competent at the doing. Right. Got it? And, but now that I'm a supervisor, okay, it actually requires a whole different set of skills. Right. Okay, because I've got the super workers who are working for me now, right? And it's not making that adjustment from being an individual contributor, the super worker, to being a supervisor or a manager or a leader that causes us to behave like we're still the smartest person in the room. You know, so what does that mean? That means when a problem comes up, <clears throat> we're the first person to say, oh, here's what we have to do and lay out the solution and hear the thing and all this kind of stuff. And then it's like, then the minions just go and, and do it, right? <laughs> right? That's completely disengaging and demoralizing. Um, and it doesn't do anything to help grow your people because the embedded expectation in that, you don't even have to say it, but people get it, is, hey, I'm the genius. You guys are just the doers. And so just do what I tell you to do. Now, that's the kind of manager that most people run away from. Right. Okay. At least most people who are worth their salt, most people who are smart and motivated and learners and want to grow and contribute to an organization will run away from. So um, watch very carefully about being the smartest person in the room. Um, you you want to make the other people around you the smartest people in the room as a leader, um, not the other way around. And if you look at that from like a hiring perspective, you know, so you, you're trying to hire all these, you know, super achievers around you. How do you know when it's, it's actually, you know, you're, you're the team member is actually not the right fit for your company? And how can you look at yourself and say, you know, or actually this is actually a, uh, an issue with myself as a leader. Is there some things you can look at to identify that and, and make a clear distinction? Yeah. Um, well, so I would start with pattern recognition, right? <clears throat> because so, so this will sound familiar and I've seen this before where, well, you know, we just can't find the right person. Um, you know, I've had three people over the last 10 months that I brought into this role and we, they all leave and we just can't find the right person. Right. Sound familiar? Yeah. So my, my question is, huh, so what do all three of those people have in common? Mm. And guess what the answer is? You hired them and they work for you. That's what they have in common. So maybe, just maybe, they're not the problem. Mm. Okay? And what is it that you need to see as a leader or realize, okay, that, that's causing you to set the situation up mm. so that this keeps happening, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, because we don't want to be a victim. We don't want to be in a position of like, oh, this keeps happening to me as a leader. We want to be in control. We want to be at cause, right? And realize, hey, I'm actually the one ultimately who's accountable for all of this. And it's my decisions and my actions that are setting all this up. Therefore, that's where I need to look first, right? Mm. Um, so that's the first place I would go. The, uh, the other thing that's really key in hiring that not a lot of organizations have properly thought out are core values. Right. And this whole idea of cultural fit, not just technical fit with the um, attributes of the job, right? So can you do the job is one set of evaluations, um, but do you fit our culture is the other. And um, a lot of organizations have core values and they're slapped around, but um, they're, <clears throat> they're not 
um, well thought through or well operationalized. And that's really the issue. And again, a qualified coach can help you go through a process to figure out um, not just what are the right core values for the organization. They have to be behavioral. They have to be behaviorally defined. And then there's a process to roll them out the right way where not surprisingly, it all starts with the integrity of the leadership team with their own core values before expecting the behavior from others. And then you can actually put specific hiring screens in place to make sure that we only let people in who are fit with the culture that we want. And that helps a lot as well. Makes sense. Um, you know, last question for, from my side, uh, Mark. Uh, you know, I'm a seasoned founder. I want to unlock my potential as a leader. I know there are sometimes you get too caught up in the day to day of the business, um, but you, you know, you need to make sure that you keep thinking clear, you know, as clearly as possible, stay focused on the big picture as the vision as the leader and the CEO. What are some steps I, I, you can, I can start taking to keep thinking, you know, stay, stay focused on the direction of what I you know, set out to do that I, I said I would a year ago uh, versus getting, you know, drifted or, uh, left and right from, you know, everything that happens around me. Yeah. So my answer to this question is keep the sequence of your thinking right. Mm. And here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> we tend to jump to solve the wrong thing for the wrong reason, but with very good intentions as leaders. Okay. And here's the sequence that I'm talking about. Okay. The first question, which I, I hope you and your listeners will realize based on the rest of this conversation today mm -hmm. is actually who, okay, who, who am I surrounded by? Am I surrounded by the right people? And do I have the right people on my team? You got to start with who, because if you got the wrong who, and you're trying to engage people in all the other stuff, mm -hmm. you, it's, it's not going to work the way you want it to. Right. And so you got to start with who the next question is why, Okay. And again, it's, this may be a little counterintuitive, but you have to know, and your team has to know really clearly, like, Hey, what are we fighting for here? Like, why does this matter? Why are we doing this thing? Um, you know, Simon Sinek wrote this amazing book and I love him as a thinker of uh, start with why. <clears throat> and he's exactly right. So when you get the who, then you got to go to the why and make sure that you and everybody else knows exactly what you're fighting for. Right. Okay. And what you're trying to achieve in the world. Like it's like the, the big why, okay? From there, you can go to what, okay? And now it's what do we actually want to accomplish in service of the why? Right. And when that's clarified, we can then go to, okay, now how? How are we going to accomplish that? Okay. And any strategic thinking process that's worth, it's, it's, that's worth anything is going to go through this sequence, Okay. And any coach who is worth their, their, their uh, uh, you know, worth it is going to also go through the sequence um, and uh, continue to be challenging, especially on the who, bringing people back to who, bringing people back to who, because that's the, that's the area, I think, where we get it wrong the most. Um, and then we're not willing to let go. And, um, and, the, and the, the, it, it's just a wreck. You know, when, when you've got the wrong people or the wrong person in a key role can really, really be damaging and demoralizing to an entire organization. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, both uh, Jim Collins with, I think, Good to Great and then also Simon Simic with Start to Why. I love their thinking of, you know, focusing on you know, the team first before the idea or what the business model is. Make sure you have the right people around you. I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, yeah. Just having those, those people. For um, sure. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Mark. That was really, really helpful. I learned quite a bit from this. I have some takeaways that I'm going to take and try to digest here. Um, where can our audience, you know, contact you or learn more about your, your coaching and uh, services and whatnot? Yeah, sure. So uh, my website is mark-green.com, M-A-R-K-G-R-E-E-N.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn at Coach Mark Green. And uh, I'm a pretty active uh, developer of content on LinkedIn. I have a newsletter there as well. Um, you can also find both of my books on uh, Amazon. Um, Activators uh, is on uh, hardcover or Kindle or Audible. Um, and Creating a Culture of Accountability is, uh, is either Kindle or hardcover. Um, this is a monograph, so it's a much thinner book. Um, on uh, a deep dive on accountability. And both the books have tools and uh, are very hands-on and practical 
um, for leaders. So that's how people can kind of benefit from my thinking and find me and connect. And I really encourage your listeners to uh, connect with me, particularly on LinkedIn. Uh, and I look forward to that. Okay, awesome, Mark. Uh, I'm going to put those links in our show notes, your, your website, your LinkedIn, also the links to your books. I'm actually going to get a copy of that as well for myself. Um, and thanks again. I appreciate this, this call. It was really helpful. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you all for listening in to today's episode. Don't forget to join us for another episode where we interview top leaders and experts in the business and SaaS industry. If you enjoyed this episode, I ask that you please give us a five-star review on iTunes. That would be really, really appreciated. Otherwise, if you have any feedback, suggestions, or improvements for this podcast, please feel free to send it directly to me on our website at horizoncapital.com. Or you can just tweet me at Akil Jabbar. Thanks again and hope to see you guys on the next episode.